As the audio system designer and the front of house engineer, it's up to you to deploy a great system and mix a great show so that every single person in the audience can enjoy what's going on clearly. No matter in the front row, on the far left, in the back row, in the balcony, wherever. But we don't always have the luxury of making sure that our main speakers can get everywhere. I wish it was that simple that everyone custom built rooms to make sure that speakers could adequately cover them. But sometimes we're in funny shapes with low ceilings and super long rooms. Sometimes we're in super wide fans or it's just a massive room. You're going to need some help. So one of the greatest tools in your tool belt as a, a system designer to make sure you can extend your system beyond the mains is delay speakers. They make sure and carry audio information and project it out to the rest of the audience so they can hear. But we need to make sure that it's done right. We need to select the right speaker, put it in the right spot, aim it in the right place, and then time align it with your mains. So today I'm gonna to walk you through step-by-step step how to go through all that, I'll lay a little bit of the foundation for what makes great coverage in your audience and how delays fit in that picture. So if you like figuring out stuff like this, using trigonometry and a lot of fun math like me, I think you'd love my audio math survival spreadsheet. I've got that here, we're gonna be looking at it a lot today, several different calculations, but you can get that at producedbymkc.com slash audio toolkit, along with a lot of other great tools. We're gonna to be relying on the wavelength formula to convert feet uh, of displacement into milliseconds of offset for our delay values. And I have a do I need delays calculator right here. So you can put in a few numbers and we'll get to a little bit later and I'll tell you, do you need delay speakers or not? So you can get that at producedbymkc.com slash audio toolkit or at the link below. All right, so let's jump into delays. Today we're gonna to figure out how to pick the right delay speaker, put it in the right spot, and make sure it is time aligned and seamless with our main speaker. And that will ensure we have a, a fantastic experience in the front row, moving through the middle of our audience and all the way to the back. We want it smooth and even, right? We're gonna divide it up today into two different sections. First is a bit of theory, just what, what we're gonna move from the ground up. What is a delay speaker? What problem is it solving for us? Uh, what does trim height and placement and aim and speaker size all have to play into what's going on? Then we'll move into a little bit more of a practical segment. We're gonna look at a specific design and say, hey, we got a couple of speakers on sticks at the front. This is a super long, narrow room. How are we gonna solve this puzzle? What delay speakers are we gonna pick? Where are we gonna put them? How do we align it? And we're gonna start from scratch and go there. It'll be a lot of fun. And I always like starting with the theory because you cannot solve a Rubik's Cube blindfolded. I think it's a lot of fun to just start twisting and figuring stuff out. And so people really want to throw some elbows and get, get in deep. But knowing a little bit of the physics and, and, and math and theory behind what's going on will help us solve this puzzle smoothly. So what are delay speakers and what do they help us do? So when I'm designing a sound system, success for me is from front row to back row and left to right, we have a less than 60 dB variance in the top end. And by top end, I mean from about 2K to 8K is the most important region. If I can get it from 1K all the way up to 16, then that's great. Sometimes I like a drop off above 8K. And then the low end is usually subject to, if I have a line array, the line length and some other factors. So I, I can't control that near as often. But if I can have the upper range, upper end, the, the clarity in dictation and intelligibility from 1K up to 8K, I am a happy camper. So if I have a system like this, where I have the stage, and we're looking at it from the side here, a main speaker, and this one out in the middle of the room is a delay speaker. And what it's doing is basically subdividing and conquering. This is not a fully optimized design. I will not necessarily point my mains and delay right here, but it shows the point that we have an audience that's deep in one speaker trying to go that far and making an even experience from front to back is really hard to do. So we enlist help, subdivide and conquer and have the delay hop on the power of the mains and get help get to the back of the room. So why do we call it a delay speaker? Is it is it behind? Is it like an echo? What's what's going on here? So if you've been to a baseball game, you've got a batter up and the pitch is thrown, they swing and they follow through and they've hit the ball. It's a line drive over the shortstop. And you've probably seen them already wrap around, have the bat behind their head again before you hear the crack of the bat on the ball. And that's because sound is a lot slower than light. It travels pretty fast at 1100 and 30 feet per second, uh, but flight is, is way faster. So we're gonna see them complete their swing before we hear the crack of the bat, because if we're, you know, 
out in center field behind those gates, we're 300, 400 feet away. So that's gonna take a little bit of time for it to get to us. So you can calculate that in my audio mass survival spreadsheet by going to the wavelength portion. And this is useful for a couple other things too, but I just put in an arbitrary number 30 feet and below that on row 23, it told me that it took 26.55 milliseconds for it to complete that 30 foot journey. So it's not quite one to one. If you need to do some back in the napkin math, that might be helpful, but you can have your multiply here and put this in and it'll give you that number. So a delay speaker uh, functions similarly uh, like a relay race. And we're gonna talk about the difference between a relay and a delay speaker here in a minute, but this analogy holds up for both. So if we have a uh, the 400 meter relay, so that's four runners, uh, each running 100 meters around one lap. So if they're at the very start of the race, the first runner, they the, the starter pistol goes off and crack, the first runner is supposed to go, and the second, third, and fourth are supposed to wait. But if we had the second runner, just start going, They would, the first runner would never catch up. So with our delay speakers who are physically displaced and put further out in our audience, we have to actually have them wait for our first runner to get there. And this is true for both delays and relay speakers. So that's why we have a delay that we insert on that second speaker. It is a digital delay line that tells the audio signal to wait for a little bit, then on our cue go so that it will come and be aligned with that runner that's running past it from the mains to the delay speaker. So what types of speakers can we use as delay speakers? Unless you have a really road show where your delay speakers have to cover up a, a much bigger area than your mains, oftentimes you just have a speaker that is less than or equal to your mains. So a delay that is less than or equal to your mains. So if you have a big giant line array that's covering 80% deep of the audience and you just need to really get a little bit of help in the back, that just might be a little under balcony speaker if you have to get in a funny spot or just a single flown point source speaker that helps bring up some intelligibility in the back. If you have a very weirdly shaped room or just a bunch of the same speaker size, you might just have a bunch of speakers on sticks around in different places to help propagate what's going on. So it's not a one size fit all solution, but you need to be able to at least keep up with the mains if you're having to cover the same amount of area. But oftentimes our delay speakers are covering a smaller area, so they don't have to be as big or as powerful. So what's the difference between delays and relay speakers? So we've already covered a delay speaker that it rides on the power of the mains and just kind of helps complete its sentence, help give a little boost in the back so we can hear it. So a relay speaker is different. And so let's say uh, I was at Dillard's the other day getting a shirt for my sister-in-law's wedding because my other white shirt, I haven't worn it since forever ago, it was terrible. And so I walked from one section of shirts over to another one across the aisle is about 30 feet away. And over my head is a little 70 volt speaker that's just playing, you know, Shania Twain B-sides or whatever. And that speaker is responsible for its specific zone. But if I move laterally out of its coverage, there's another speaker over on the other side and it's responsible for its zone. So they are not overlapped at all, but it's meant to provide an even experience throughout the entire store because they are relaying or yeah, relaying and handing off the baton to each other. So uh, in a delay system, it would be like the first runner ran up to this to the second and was able to keep up and keep running with them. In a true relay race, the first one hands it off to second and she stops. So that's the difference here. Sometimes you don't you want to have your mains if it's not an incredibly powerful system. It can't really go the full depth of the audience. So you just have it responsible for its zone, then completely hand off responsibilities to the relay speaker. So there are pros and cons to each each approach, but it's a pretty complex set of variables on a show that might dictate each. So I just want you to be aware of the differences, but know uh, that today we're going to be focusing on delays. So when do you need delays? If you have a greater than four to one front to back distance ratio. So what do I mean by that? So we look at the same side view. Here's a speaker on a stick that's 10 feet in the air and it's thrown to the back of this audience. And uh, the, the speaker to the front row is 10 feet and then the entire audience depth is 60 feet. So it's thrown to the back row 70.5 feet and then to the first row only 12.2 feet. So if I put that 
uh, to, to convert to the amount of decibel change, the starting value, ending value of those two distances that's throwing, I can see here in row 40 that that multiplier is almost six. So that's a six to one range ratio of how far it's having to work, how hard it's having to work to throw to the back row versus the front row. But I just told you earlier, I thought you wanted to less than a six decibel variance and four to one is 12 dB. So why am I willing uh, to let it be up to 12 dB? Two things, the, the first is axial shift. So on a speaker, this is an 80, 80 degree speaker and we're looking top down on it. We have the center throw and basically has it goes off to the left and to the right 40 degrees each. So we can look at the, here the coverage that um, this, this maps out to here and I can see pretty clearly that these colors show me that this speaker is gonna go about 80 degrees wide. And I can see here on the right hand SPL bar that from the same distance forward, I think I measured 40 feet forward uh, on axis or straight off the center of the speaker, and then I moved away 40 degrees off axis and went another 40 feet, that is a six decibel difference. So if I'm back here in the front row, the very center throw of that speaker is gonna be the loudest point. As I move further off axis, I'm gonna lose some energy. So since I'm a little bit off axis of the speaker, this six to one range ratio isn't a quite a linear application since the front row is at a different relationship to the on axis of the speaker than the back row. It's not a huge discrepancy here, but it plays into it. And secondly is room gain. If you if you have a speaker inside a room, you're gonna get some energy that's bouncing around the room that helps amplify what's going on and give you back some of that. So if it's a really echoey or a lot of hard parallel surfaces, it can get a lot of flutter echo and that can hurt you, but you do get some level back uh, depending on the room geometry and the acoustic material. And it's a pretty complex thing, but you're, you're gonna get a little bit of energy from the room itself that'll help out with that range ratio. So when do range ratios easily get too high? And so we want it less than four to one. The first is obvious in that you have super long rooms. And so if you have a speaker on sticks and the front row is 10 feet away, they're having to throw 200 feet away. That is a huge discrepancy, but with how far that speaker is having to go to the first row to the back row. And secondly, that affects us is low trim heights. So we see this all the time, speakers on sticks on top of stubs, and it looks cute and it's efficient, but I'd say don't do it um, if you have another option. Because if you have a low trim height or low, uh, the speaker is not very high off the ground, then that sets you up for failure if you have a close front row, because getting a speaker up can increase the distance from the front row, but it's a less increase relatively to the back row. So if you're gonna get a speaker stand, get something like this K&M that can get your speaker way up in the air, or you can just fly them. So let's look at the difference here on this design. So here's a speaker that is 10 feet in the air, um, and it, again, it's throwing 12.2 feet to the first row, 70.5 feet to the back, and is a six to one range ratio. Let's raise it another eight feet in the air. So I got 18 foot trim height and that lessened my range ratio. It almost cut it in half. So it's only 3.6 to one versus six to one. So it's throwing 20 feet to the first row. And then it only increased the back row throw by foot and a half, even though I raised it eight feet, but it increased the throw to the front row uh, by a little bit less than eight feet. So just by getting your speaker up in the air, you can do a lot for yourself uh, with the trim height to, to really help that. So let's look at that coverage. So here is a center speaker on a 60 by 60 foot deep by 40 feet audience. And we can see here that the negative 60 B point happens right at the middle of the audience. Then everything drops down behind that. And we have a close, a little over 12 dB discrepancy, maybe even 13 in the back <coughs> when, when you're there. And all I'm gonna do is raise the speaker up and point it at the back row. And that gets the vast majority of our audience within a four or five dB span. And it's not until we get the very back row that we're a little bit over six, maybe seven dB. So trim height helps in other ways too than just coverage. So here's a install that I was on at here at a local church. They didn't have a huge budget, so I had to be efficient, but still make sure the entire congregation here could see. So this is a day I was, we were gonna hang this speaker and uh, this, this audience size in this room is the same of what we're looking at. Here's an 18 foot trim and what I could cover with a single center speaker. So I was like, well, if they don't have a whole lot of budget for a left, right, or can't even put a sub in right now, could I do the entire room with one speaker? 
So I threw the speaker I could get here in Ease Focus 3, which is, is a PC-based software that can accept a lot of different manufacturer speakers and throw them in there. And from front to back, the first row is 10 feet, so that's at 101.5 dB, and drops down to a little bit over 98. So that's only a 3 dB difference front to back if I had that speaker at that trim height there. And then from left to right, it dips down to a little bit over 97 up to 102, so left to right, I'm still within that 6 dB window. So here's that speaker we hung in the air, just a single one, it was a 90 by 60 box. So, and it's a good rule, the range ratio is greater than two to one, just go ahead and point the speaker at the back row. And why that is, is earlier we discussed that the speaker has its greatest high frequency content on axis or at the center of his throw, and then it slowly wanes off. So we want that greatest high energy throw in the high frequencies to go right at that back row because that's the farthest it has to go. So we have the speaker in the air, and this is me tuning the rig. I got two microphones, one in the center of the room at the front row, and one at the back row. So we have that green mic and that blue mic. And again, 90 by 60 box pointed at the back row. And these were my traces in Smart. And this is uh, no trace offset, no nothing. And they track beautifully together. So this was the front end mic, uh, front and rear microphone. So my software was telling me I was gonna have close to a 3 dB, 3 dB discrepancy. But after putting it in the room, there's really no discrepancy at all. They overlap. Maybe the, the front one is under just a hair, but they track really nicely together. So this was a combination to make sure I had the right box in the air, aiming at the right spot, making sure it's 60 degrees spread. So 90 by 60, so 90 horizontally, 60 vertically. So from the center point, the 30 degrees reach downward to get to the front row. And then the 90 degrees reached wide enough to make sure that the entirety of the audience could hear. So I had no delays, no front fills. There was only one install date with one speaker and there was not very much tonal variance throughout the room. And that saved resources because they only had to buy one speaker. It saved time because they only had to do one install date and it was really quick to tune. It was less complexity. This was a very inexperienced volunteer audio team. So I wanted to hand them something that could easily understand and operate. So only having to worry about one speaker is pretty nice. It was also more intelligibility. They didn't have, they had zero sound damping in that room. So I want to keep the minimum amount of energy off the walls and minimum amount of sound sources bouncing around. So just one speaker gives you one single point to focus on. I ended up mixing their opening Sunday in that new building. And they said it was the best that ever sounded. Um, you know, I'm not God's gift to audio, but it's just cool to use this, this math to be able to put this, the, the right gear in the right place on their budget. And they had a great experience and that was very satisfying. So. So what if you don't have prediction software? And so I use two of them here. The, both of those are free, by the way. I use Map3D and Ease Focus 3. You can go and Google those and find their links. But what if you do not have that software? So you can go to row 50 in my audio mass survival spreadsheet and there's a do I need delays calculator. And you can do a little, it does the trig for you because you figure out the speaker trim height, the listener head height, how far it is from the speaker base to the front row and the speaker base to the back row. And this one is assuming that you have a flat floor and a flat audience. I'm gonna work on one that gives you the ability to incline the audience, but I'm not that good at Google Sheets yet. So here is a physical layout of the, of the, the setup we have been looking at now or have before. The speaker is 10 feet in the air. That's one data point This the, from the floor to the tweeter vertically. The audience is standing and I use five and a half feet for that for ear height. From the speaker base, so at the bottom of what is going to be the speaker stand to the front row is 10 feet. And then from the bottom of the speaker stand all the way to the back is 70 feet. So those are the four input points that you need. And then it's gonna tell you yes or no, if we need delays. So again, it's gonna say if that, uh, basically the P Pythagorean theorem that's doing the hypotenuse of both those triangles that it's triangulating from here to the first row and here to the back row. If that's more than a four to one distance ratio, it's gonna say, yes, you do need delays. So I would ultimately do your homework, put in a speaker, get a GLL file, put it in ease, or use map with a speaker that closely approximates where you can put it in there. But this is a good shorthand way to do it in the field if you don't have a computer or software and can make it all happen. So how do we choose the placement of our delay speaker once we know that we need one? And then how do we align our delays to our main? So now we're moving into the practice section of what's going on. 
So here's our same room from a different angle, a little bit of 3D. And we're going to have a design and pretend we have, are under some different circumstances and we can't fly. So uh, the reality rate is 10 feet from the stage front to the front row. It's a narrow room. It's 60 feet deep versus 40 feet wide. And I have a standing audience. That's a good thing to really keep in mind. If you have standing versus sitting, especially in the install environment, you need, that uh, can make or break a design, especially if you have a really low ceiling. So you got to get that right. So we're going to use uh, a calculation, the forward aspect ratio. This is from Bob McCarthy's book to figure out uh, at minimum what speaker we would need if we had to do one. And I put in here on row 75, the depth and width of the room. It tells me the aspect ratio is 1.5. The forward aspect ratio, it says I need an 84 degree speaker to do this right. So we got 80 degree speakers on the truck. So we're in good shape. I have an entire video that I did for the Audio University channel. That's Kyle Mathias or Mathias. I, I, I forget how to pronounce your last name. I'm sorry, Kyle. Uh, but it walks you through that much more in depth on a horizontal coverage standpoint. So make sure and find that. It's just put into Google's speaker coverage calculator and audio university and you will find it it was a lot of fun working with him so this is a single flown 80 degree speakers at our 18 foot trim height so we've seen this before and this is just at a different angle but what if we can't fly and what we've got on the truck are four speakers and four sticks so these are four 80 degree speakers and we can put them uh, left right and we need a left right delay so here are the left, right, 80 degree speakers on sticks at a 10 foot trim. That's how high we can get our speaker stand up. And that is what our prediction looks like. And so if zero dB is a front row and we fall down from there, the very back row looks like it's more than 12 dB down, which is unacceptable. <laughs> it is as uh, if we can get it below, we, I guess it's, it's towing the line of like, we, do we really need delays? I guess you could technically do this show if you just ran it a little bit hot for the front, but you might run into feedback issues. So, but let's see if we can make this better by integrating some delays. So some th three mic locations I almost always do, uh, if I'm, especially if I'm tuning quick, because they just put one in the front row, the middle of the room, and the back row. If I've got a line array with specific segments that I'm tuning, then I'll be a little bit more fine-tuned with that. But if you got to move quickly, it's hard to go wrong with this. And why I picked the left side is that this is a symmetrical room with the left-right setup. So I'm going to focus on uh, making this left quadrant sound good and then i'll just duplicate the results over to the right so i would be tuning this room just with the left speaker soloed and then i might verify at the end in the middle with both of the speakers on so i have taken measurements from each of those three mic locations and you can see here the red trace is the front row blue is the middle and purple is the bottom and that is a 15 db discrepancy in map uh, in map 3d so i just guessed from the little weather map here that it was going to be about 12 but it's actually 15 and so that's that's good to know that okay that definitely breaks my rule of four to one range ratio or 12 db uh which is four yeah four to one from the back so we need to divide and conquer with the lace so an easy way to do this is just hey look let's let's divide the audience in half if we have four of the same speaker we can ask the same task of each of them so we got the front zone and the rear zone so here's the just the front two speakers and with these divisions now in line and now if we added two more in the back and they're just covering their rear zone and now let's turn all four of them together and so let's look at our results and we'll backpedal a little bit and how I placed it there. Uh, and that creates a less than four dB discrepancy, which is great. So we just took it down from negative 15 or a 15 dB discrepancy to four. So we increased by 11 dB of, of, of variance to make this a really uniform experience for everyone in our audience with delay speakers. So as far as placement goes, it really came down to, okay, I've got these front speakers. I'm not gonna put them out too crazy wide because I want to be able to cover the middle and not use a front fill. And they are aiming the middle of their zone here. So they are the, the middle of the middle of their half. And so it's aimed right through here. And then I basically looked here at the, the front and thought like, okay, they, they start to fall off and I have, I'm 6 dB down right at the halfway point through the room. So that led to intuitively think that, okay, if there's it's 6 dB less at the back of the, or at the middle of the room that I can add my delay speaker and it can start to pick up from there. I ended up adding them and I, I wanted this line right here of the 
off axis edge to intersect with the mains at this middle point. And so I didn't quite have them here right at the center point, uh, but I gave them a little bit of room and they intersected right here. And then they are aimed back again towards this same zone to go back towards the center. And that created a really nice uniform pattern for the whole audience. Those are at the same trim height and they're just angled in to make sure they can cover and get to the center of the audience. You might be asking, is this getting quite a bit of comb filtering? Yes, but what's the alternative? I can't fly anything. I have to go on the side. I can't put the, the, the speakers in the center. Um, and if someone, unless they're sitting right in the middle, if they are right in the middle, they're getting both speakers equally. So they're fine. It's the people just like a foot off center who are getting the worst results. But the more you move closer to a single speaker, your ear is going to prioritize that. But we're going to help with some of that uh, comb filtering and kind of timing weirdness by making sure we are time aligned. So how are we going to do that? So as a friendly reminder, time travels at 1130 feet per second. And we can only align at one point. We can't variably push our delay lines during the show. So we need to pick one spot. So the question is where? Where in the world are we going to align our speakers? So the key is to look for high interaction or overlap. And so as I said earlier, I chose to have the edge of this speaker coverage to intersect where this one was at the middle. So this red part is where it's high SPL. And this is, I chose to see like, hey, where is this red part intersecting the most with what is the next highest level point um, on that front speaker? And that ended up being right here, basically at my middle mic position. So to look at it from a different angle, it's right here. So how do we align it? So just like our relay race earlier, where the, the starter pistol fired and that first runner is running. So they are moving across and we have to tell our second runner to wait until they get there. So we need to measure that. So we can do that in audio analyzer software by ha having our propagation delay times set and it can find that and getting the delta delay, which is super quick and easy, or we can measure it uh, in the field where we'll talk about both. So from this speaker measure to that microphone position, and then this speaker to that one is 18 feet. So if we know how fast time travels, then we can convert that value to milliseconds. Uh, some consoles on their processing outputs actually give you the conversion from feet to milliseconds and vice versa, and some DSPs do, but mo the most common language they're gonna speak is milliseconds. So that's how I would do that. So I just got two copies of the uh, row 20 here and I put in those two different uh, distances and that gave me the time in milliseconds equivalent to that. So it's 37.52 and 15.93. And so we have that here that is the same thing expressed a different way. So it's instead of the, the distance the speaker is from that main left speaker to the middle mic, and then my delay left speaker to my middle mic, uh, that's the propagation time it takes for audio to, to pass from that speaker to that microphone. So what I got to do is figure out the difference. So I got to have it wait for that amount of time and put that in my delay line. So that difference is 21.58 milliseconds. And so I'm here in Map 3D, I'm just gonna use their simulated galaxy uh, to figure that out. And I entered in that delay line and I also turned down my delay 1 dB to provide a little bit more of an even experience since it's not having to cover as far as the mains. That's what I just kind of fine tuned to make sure it was even. And I was able to align at those two points. But not all of us have prediction software or even audio analyzer software, but you should just get Open Sound Meter. It's free and donate to them if you ended up using it. Um, I know it's smart, is amazing. I use it, but it's expensive for someone who, especially who's new. So if you're an audio veteran and really wanna level up, go ahead and get smart, but please start with Open Sound Meter and get started and get used to using audio analyzer software. But let's say you don't got your computer and you just need to guesstimate the feel, how would you figure it out? I've got a um, process for you. You need three things. You need transient HF driven music. And so uh, a track that I think is great for this is Get Lucky by Daft Punk. Uh, the BPM is, 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 or the kick drum pattern is very steady and the hi-hats have a nice, a, a lot of high crispy transient energy that your ear can latch onto because the, the high end is what is gonna matter the most as far as, as alignment because your ear is gonna pick up on any, pop, 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 any offset between high energy spikes. You need a metronome app. You can get that on your phone. There's one called Tempo that I use and have it at 40 BPM. And make sure it has a nice spiky sound, not a bloop bloop, but a ping tick 
tick sound on the click. Excuse me. They need a disto or a laser tape, or you could end up using a measuring tape if you have one that's that's long. So what you're gonna do is go back to our same design. You're gonna play the music and walk along what you think is gonna be your alignment position. Um, I know that that overlap is gonna happen somewhere within this blue arrow. And you're gonna have the music going equally to both your main left and your delay left speaker. And you're gonna walk and fine tune like, hey, at this spot, I hear them equally and I'm hearing the timing offset between the two and it's bugging the crap out of me. So wherever it sounds worst from a timing offset and they sound equal and level, that's your alignment spot. You're gonna measure the distances to the alignment point. And so what I do is I take my disto or my laser tape, I put it on my forehead, I just turn to the speaker and I measure the distance to the delay speaker and then to the mains and I write those down. And then I put that in and I convert them to milliseconds and then I'm able to figure out the delta delay again. Uh, so I enter that delta and I put it in my processor and away we go. And the last step with the metronome is I play that metronome at 40 BPM. That's, that's very slow. It's nice and pingy. And I just walk front to back in the room. And if I hear that ping, 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 as I walk, I should not hear any smearing or differences along that on axis line as I'm walking back to front, all without any audio analyzer or prediction software. One last workaround, I know we talked a lot about trim height to make sure we can lessen our front to back distance ratio, but something I've started doing a little bit uh, more recently after stealing this from a colleague's design is you can cheat your PA a little bit upstage. And so what I mean by this is on a, on a big show recently, we were in an arena and I was hanging some RCF speakers here in the air and I wanted I had a really close throw from here to my front row versus throwing all the way back here. I think it was 150, 160 feet, and then only 20 or 30 down to here. So it was a pretty big discrepancy. And so one way to do that, instead of going, I, I couldn't go any higher, uh, and so I moved upstage. And what that did is you can see here that this is actually next to the stage, not quite even with the front where most PAs start. And that helps lessen the range ratio just on a different axis versus the, I guess that'd be Y axis. I moved back on the Z axis, which was helpful to make sure my range ratio was lessened from front to back. And I've even done this with some K-12s on a stage in a really wide room. I went, I scooted them way back. And you can just trust that the waveguides are really gonna steer the high-end energy and skirt that around the stage. So you have to know your speaker coverage pattern, make sure you're not getting feedback, all that. But it can really help to make sure you have a, a better front-to-back listening experience. Okay, what did we learn today? Sound takes time to travel, right? 1130 feet per second. You can calculate that and make sure you use it for your delay times. Delay speakers help increase tonal and level uniformity uh, front to back and or reduce variance. So is the glass half full, half empty, whatever. Uh, so in making it more uniform by helping the mains when the mains run out of gas uh, uh, as compared to the front row. So we wanna make sure that is even in front to back. And we reduced earlier a design with just the front speakers was a 15 dB difference front to back uh, to less than four decibel difference, which is pretty cool. Trim height really matters. If you can get speakers in the air, then great. If you got speaker stands, send them all the way up. If you don't have tall speaker stands, get some. They are really helpful. So we got a 10 foot high speaker versus 18 foot. And look at the differences in range ratio. Six to one versus 3.6 to one, uh, just by raising it up eight feet. Really, really helpful. And lastly, alignment is everything. Make sure and do your homework and walk the space and don't just slap up a delay speaker and don't figure out what the alignment needs to be. Uh, measure it with the with a disto, use a measurement microphone and do it in software, however you want to do it, but convert to milliseconds, enter in that delta delay and make sure you are aligned. All right, that was everything about delays. Thanks for sticking around, uh, covering some of the theory and implementation, how to make sure delays work for you in your show. Uh, don't forget to my get to my uh, audio mass survival spreadsheet at uh, the link below or produced by nkc.com slash audio toolkit. I would love for you to let me know below what was the biggest aha moment for you today? How you've been doing something uh, differently with delays that you might be doing uh, different now? Or uh, am I seeing something completely wrong? And how are you setting up for delays? And maybe you're doing them differently by ear. All right, I'm Michael. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today and I will catch you next time.